Okay. Hello, everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for February 21st, 2023. This is the time of week when we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Dan, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. You might ask, what is CircuitPython? It's a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit. So if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider, consider purchasing hardware from adafruit.com. Um, this meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. Typically, this meeting happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific Time, except for what coincides with the U.S. holiday. That's what happened this week, and so it was on Tuesday this week. Uh, in the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. Uh, we also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonista's Discord role, and then you'll be um, notified when that role gets a message, is, 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 is mentioned. There is a uh, Google Notes document to accompany the meeting and recording. The Notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video. So you use the doc to view, you can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes, so this gives you the option to skip around. After each meeting, we post a link for the next meeting's notes to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. You can check the pinned messages in that channel to find the latest notes doc. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. All right, I will skip over explaining the meeting structure because uh, we're going to do that each time. I come to the item, so it's probably not worth it. Um, so now we'll begin. Um, let me start um, with some community news, and I'll set it, make a timestamp. Uh, community news is news that comes from our weekly Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, which goes out on email Tuesday mornings. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to the newsletter. Thanks to Anne for putting the newsletter together. If you have any Python on hardware projects to share or find content you'd like to see included in the newsletter, please consider contributing. You can open a PR on GitHub uh, to the newsletter repo. You can um, tweet to at sign and underscore engineer on Twitter with the hashtag CircuitsPython, or you can email cpnews at adafruit.com with the news and a link, links if you have them. Uh, and if somebody can paste the newsletter in, uh, link in, that would be great. Um, now I'll start with the community news, which is the sort of the top headlines from this week's newsletter, which already came out this morning. Um, first of all, uh, the Raspberry Pi uh, organization has released the Raspberry Pi Debug Probe, which has cost $12, just came into the Adafruit store yesterday, and I have one on order. Um, this is a, a plug-and-play debug kit for debugging uh, Raspberry Pi Picos and probably uh, other, uh, other boards that use SWD. Um, it will use open OCD under the covers. Um, so it contains a USB to serial uh, uh, SWD bridge. It contains a generic USB serial adapter and cables to hook up to the host computer and the debug target. And as I said, while it has been designed with Raspberry Pi Pico and other 20, RP2040 based targets in mind, the Raspberry Pi debug probe can also be used to debug any ARM based microcontroller that provides an SWD port with 3.3 volt uh, I.O. And I'll be interested to see how this works compared with a, uh, with a J-Link, because it's now certainly cheaper than getting a J-Link. Um, next news item is um, that CircuitPython 8.0.2 was released. Uh, this is a bug fix release for 8.0.0. Um, and we found some bugs. 
Um, there's, there are links to the release notes for this uh, and um, the announcement, and there will be an 803 soon also. I'll talk about that later. Uh, next news item is uh, about using an iPad or Android to code MicroPython or CircuitPython. Um, do you need to write some MicroPython or CircuitPython code for your board but don't have a PC around? How about using your phone or tablet? iSyst Incorporated provides their solution with their Blue IO 832 Mini and Blue IO Term app for iOS and Android. So this is interesting. This is um, an app uh, and a small Bluetooth adapter for um, any uh, CircuitPython board or MicroPython board. We also have uh, the CircuitPython organization also provides um, Bluetooth support for boards that have built-in Bluetooth, and we have an app. We have apps for this. Um, you can uh, find out about that in our learn guides. I don't have. I won't put the links in right now. So finally, as I mentioned, those are the top news items. And I'll just mention again that you can contribute to this newsletter and these news items by um, sending emails to cpnews at adafruit.com or Twitter or sending a poll request to the newsletter. All those things are appreciated. All right, the next uh, major section today is um, the state of CircuitPython libraries and Blinka. Um, this section is a quantitative overview of the entire CircuitPython project. It gives us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from what we're up to. We'll talk about the project overall, then separately discuss the core, libraries, and Blinka. First up, uh, the overall idea of what's going on. In the past week, I think this is as of uh, Monday midnight, or maybe Sunday midnight, there were 30 pull requests merged with 19 authors. Um, there are some new people here I don't recognize. P. Jeffries, Shultronics, um, maybe Dave C.T., Matsu Jirushi. Um, thank you very much if those are you contributors, or thank you if you're contributing, contri uh, continuing contributors. Uh, of these 30 pull requests, uh, there were seven reviewers of these pull requests, and there were 29 closed issues by 13 people and 24 opened by 20 people. So we closed a net five, which is great. All right. Uh, next up, uh, we have uh, some information about the CircuitPython core. And uh, Scott, if you were available to read about the core, that would be great. Yeah, happy to. Uh, OK, so for the stats for the core of CircuitPython, uh, we had 22 pull requests merged from 14 different authors, which is awesome. Um, I feel that, like that number is higher than it usually is. So thank you to all of our authors. I think some new folks here, or, or infrequent folks, are Neradoc, Ginevrov, Atlantor, Bergdahl, w 2 or Bill88T, um, lots of new folks. So thank you to those uh, folks for contributing to the core. We had four reviewers, um, myself, Microdev, Dan, and Lady Ada. We have 31 open pull requests. Uh, a number of those are drafts. Um, many, many of them are drafts. Uh, and a lot of these have to do with boards or hardware. So uh, if you want to help contribute to the core, it's great if um, you are able to do testing for new boards. Um, a lot of these are boards that are not Adafruit boards, and therefore, like those of us paid by Adafruit, don't necessarily have them. Um, so please take a look at that. Um, I'd love to get it under 25, which is the cap for having it on a single page. <laughs> That's kind of my metric. Um, so taking a look at those pull requests would be really helpful. Uh, Issues-wise for the co core, we had 17 closed issues by 8 people and 15 opened by 2, so we're net down 2 as well. Um, and lots of people are involved, so thank you to those folks. We have a total of 618 open issues. We have 8 active milestones. Um, two, on eight zero, 2 issues are open on 80X, which is like the most immediate things that we want to fix. We have 12 open issues for 8.1, which will be our next uh, major or feature stable, stable release for 8.1, or for 8.0. Um, and we have 499 long-term issues. We have eight 
open support issues, which uh, would be wonderful if folks would take a look at and close those as well. Those are kind of a bucket for like questions that usually should end up on the forums instead or on the Discord. Um, so it's likely that those are ready to be closed. Uh, we have five issues not a assigned a milestone, which means that we have some triaging to do. And that's the state of the core. Okay, thank you, Scott. Yeah, and I'll just note that I assigned a number of these uh, board PRs to draft status because they're mostly awaiting um, USB uh, product IDs or vendor and or product IDs. Uh, and they're kind of hung up because of that. And so I marked them as drafts so they wouldn't inadvertently be merged because they're otherwise, many of them are off or are, are are otherwise complete. Mm. Um, just trying to distinguish them easily. Um, okay, next up is uh, the libraries. And um, Katni is not here this week. Uh, so uh, perhaps I will go ahead and read the libraries section. Um, so in the past week, there were seven pull requests merged from five authors. There were five reviewers. Um, there's a lot of work in the mini MQTT library right now. That's really great. A lot of people are working on fixing things in there. There are currently 48 open pull requests. Um, and there were 12 issues closed by 10 people and nine open by eight people. So again, a net uh, gain, a, a net, uh, we have more issues closed than open, which is great. Um, there are now 597 open issues in the libraries and there are 76 issues marked as good first issue. You can use GitHub to find those issues. And those are uh, issues that are probably good for a person who's making their first contribution to uh, working on a library. We, it's a very good learning experience and we're happy to mentor you uh, in help with CircuitPython channels and Discord to help you out with that. Um, in the past week, in terms of library stats, there were or totally there were 188, almost 189,000 PyPy downloads for libraries. Um, and I won't read the top 10 libraries or the uh, library updates, but I'll just mention again, uh, uh, if you'd like to contribute to CircuitsPython, uh, look for issues in the libraries that uh, are good first issue or that appeal to you. Um, there are more issues there than uh, the people who were paid by Adafruit to work on the libraries can work on, and we really appreciate your help in that. So thank you very much. Okay, next up is the section on uh, Blinka and uh, Maker Melissa, if you could read that section, thank you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, uh, so Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And uh, this week we had one pull request merged by one author and one reviewer. Uh, there were there are currently six open pull requests among the different repositories. Uh, there were zero closed issues. We currently have ninety open issues, and there were twenty seven thousand one hundred sixty two PyPI downloads in the last week. Uh, Seven thousand and seventy five. Pi wheels down was in the last month, and we are at 101 boards. Okay. And that's it. Thank you very much, Melissa. Okay. Yeah. Our next section, our next major section is Hug Reports. Um, Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start as host, and then we'll go down the list, which is mostly in alphabetical order. Uh, if you're text only or missing the meeting, uh, but you wrote a hug report, I'll just read them off as I get to you in the list. So as I said, I will start. Um, so I'd like to thank Alan Mitchell uh, for finding a uh, QtPy M0 UART bug in, in 8.0, which we has been present since 8.00 Alpha 1, apparently, but nobody spotted it. So thanks, Alan, for that. And I have a fix for that, which will be in 8.03. Um, thanks to Dave Putz, who's working on TLS and MQTT, and as usual, is 
extremely good at finding obscure things and uh, figuring out how to fix them. Thanks to Gambler21 for a color con for a fix for the color converter in Display I/O. There was it, there were uninitialized fields in there, and you would get random results depending on what was in memory when the object was allocated. Uh, thanks to Greg Neveroff for continued fixes on the core, and thanks to our translators who are keeping up with a number of new and changed messages, especially as we move to a new major version. There were quite a few new messages that have appeared in the past few weeks, and we really appreciate them uh, doing translations very quickly. Okay, uh, next up is Anecdata, and I'll read theirs. Um, thanks to Dan H. for developing the safe mode.py mechanism, and thanks to G. Neverov for fixing the Pico W LWIP MDNS issue. And I would second that. Okay, next up is um, DJ Devin 3. Hello, thank you. I have a hug for JP for a very informative stream about circuit bending uh, using the Meowzik toy piano. That was a lot of fun to watch. To Liz for an awesome Octoprint learn guide that I'm still trying to digest. And for taming the breadboard spaghetti monster with new well-designed PCBs. Congratulations. Uh, and a hug to Lady Ada and Phil T for staying up late on Sundays to teach us the ways of good PCB design. That's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, and next up is Jeff. Hi, I want to start off with a group hug, but also some in particular, one for Liz, Blitz City DIY, for helping out with some guides. I'm working on, I'm doing some product guides, and she created the downloads page with the schematic and fab print and all that good stuff, um, which I don't know how to do. Another hug for Phil B, Paint Your Dragon, for commiserating with me on the fritzing in one of those upcoming guides. It's got an uncommon number of wires, um, and for that one, you're just going to want to read the pros and not look at that wiring diagram as the way to create your project. Uh, and finally, to Gene Everoff for continuing to ask good questions, offer suggestions, and the most important thing, offer working code. I uh, really appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, next is uh, Jose David, who's not in the meeting, so I'll read theirs. Uh, thanks to Matsu Jirushi for a PR to improve the ADD, ADT 7410 documentation. Thanks to Bill eighty eight T for persisting uh, using an RPI four to get the stackless uh, PR going. Yes, uh, Bill eighty eight T is very patient with their compiles. Um, thanks to Gene Everoff for core work, and thanks to P J Jeffries for correcting documentation and type hits, type hints in the BNO zero fifty five library. And next up is Maker Melissa. I just want to give a group hug to everyone. All right, thank you. Okay, and um, Mark Gambler, you're up next, if you're able. Otherwise, I'll read yours. Okay. I think I will read. No voice today. Okay, so Mark says, thanks to Foamy Guy for continuing to look at the GIF work and finding an issue with Color Converter. Thanks to Tanud and Deshipu for the GIF PR review and API suggestions. And thanks to everyone who expressed appreciation to me for the GIF PR. This is the animated GIFs. It's not required, but amazing how much a kind word can make your day. Yes, we all appreciate being appreciated. Thank you. All right, uh, next up is Scott. Hello, a couple quick ones. Uh, Mark and Foamy Guy for the color converter fix. And also, uh, InnoPolTech, who filed an issue having to do with uh, a caching issue on STM flash reads, which looks uh, pretty serious to me. And uh, so thanks to them for, for adding a kind, or filing a kind issue about it, and hopefully they'll fix it as well. All right, thank you. And finally, uh, Tectric is up and not here, so I'll read theirs. Uh, thanks to Dan H for SafeMode.py, super neat. Thanks to Dan H. and Maker Melissa for feedback on how to back handle the broken stats page on circuitpython.org, which we just removed. We decided it wasn't worth it. Uh, thanks to Wakwi for the core of the RP2040JS node.js emulator code, which is a very interesting thing that you can run um, an emulation of RP2040 in your browser. 
thanks to Tanu, Naradoc, and Microdev for interest and feedback on using ideas for using RP2040.js in GitHub Actions. And a group hug. Okay, that's it for um, hug reports. Next up is status updates. Uh, status updates is our time to sync up on what we're doing. I will start and we'll go down the list alphabetically as usual. Uh, when I, the idea is that when I call on you, you'll take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you're doing until the next meeting. Uh, this is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion becomes too much for status updates, we can move it to in the weeds. And so this is things that you can be do doing relevant to CircuitPython or just things that you're doing in general that are interesting. It does not have to be. It could be that you're renovating your kitchen and you didn't get to do a lot of CircuitPython this week. All right. I will start. Uh, so I've been working on the UF2 SAMD121 bootloader, which is not strictly CircuitPython, but a user found several issues with it. I've made a version that enables brownout detection, which can uh, cause uh, inadvertent flash writes, and that user is testing that right now. Uh, I did safe mode.py. Um, that's merged, and it will be in 8.1.0, the next beta, hopefully. I'm writing a guide on it uh, right now. As I mentioned, the user found a serious UART bargain 802 on the QDPI M0. Um, it has to do with which pins are assigned, why it was particularly relevant on the QDPI M0. Uh, there's a fix which will be put in the 803 bug fix release. And Finally, I made a board definition for the plain old Huzzah 32 breakout, which is a plain ESP32 room module. This should be useful for a lot of generic ESP32 boards or kind of bare module use. And this should be in the 810 beta, the first beta that comes out for 810. All right, uh, next up is DJ Devon. Thank you. Uh, this week, or just an hour ago, I shipped batch two of the TR cowbells. Uh, if anyone has any components that are missing, please let me know. Uh, this time, I got some small 4x12 cardboard boxes to make the packaging a little bit more respectable and rugged with bubble wrap, so it's not just going to come in like a custom flat pack box kind of thing. Um, completed my first printables make this week, uh, which was Brent Rebell's IoT G mailbox. While the code in the learn guide is deprecated due to Gmail's API no longer working for that particular thing, the 3D printing files themselves made the physical project of um, 3D printing the, the cute little mailbox very, very easy. And it's an adorable little mailbox. I love it. Uh, the small flag design is honestly easy to miss, so I wanted something bigger and louder that will definitely get my attention. So I am currently printing a full-size mailbox in clear PET-G as uh, I, it will also test my 3D printer's full build volume, biggest thing I've ever printed. The estimated time for the print just for the main shell is 90 hours or four days, and it's been printing for four days straight and should complete in a couple hours, actually. Uh, it will use an ESP32 S2 with an RFM95 you know, slash LoRa Featherwing and a TFT display as an all-in-one notifier. So it will notify me of mailbox activity at my actual mailbox outside, as well as Octoprint and MQTT integration from Liz's Learn Guide uh, for my 3D printing status. Uh, and I'm hoping that stuffing a whole bunch of NeoPixels in the translucent mailbox should make it look pretty and definitely get my attention when that goes off. So that's, I think that's, oh, wait, no. Oh, yep. I guess I wrote more. Uh, I might add an amplifier with large speakers. I That's an idea. Put it on the, the flip tops. Is just bolt some speakers. It's audio. You, you got to. Um, uh, and I have kind of tentative plans to call it a boom mailbox. Like, I've never heard of anybody creating that kind of thing. And it just, I thought that was a cool idea. Um, the STL files are, well, they will be available on my printables page when I'm done and make sure that the design works. Um, uh, and also this week I created a 3D printer bed calibrator PCB that 
came on the slow boat from China and arrived. It's based on an e-leveler PCB by Chep, which is like a manual bed leveling thing if you've ever leveled your 3D printer with a sheet of paper kind of thing. This takes away the, the need to use the sheet of paper and you just have an LED that goes off. And as everybody knows, the LEDs that come on are instantaneous. So the accuracy when you press the button on the nozzle for the LED is highly repeatable versus the feel of a sheet of paper which can introduce human error. So I thought that was a really neat idea and I took it, ran with it, created my own and also created one that has a gantry level uh, associated with that so that's what i've been up to this week printing and doing 3d stuff and pcb stuff that's it thanks all right thank you very much okay uh, next up is g Neverov. hi so i've been um getting back to working on um exploring what we can do with async apis and now i'm doing it in the context of uh, audio um, and just to give myself a goal there, I'm trying to, um, get a program to stream the audio, um, over the network and, and play it and have that sort of run smoothly, like in an async loop that doesn't block other things. I'm also like happening at the same time, like, you know, flashing a LED or something. Um, so I'm not really there yet, but, uh, that is, um, what I'm working on. All right. Thanks very much. That looks like that will be very interesting. I think that's a kind of a use case we haven't really been able to do at all yet. Okay. Uh, next up is Jeff. All right. So uh, for it feels like about two weeks now, I've been working on the OV5640. Uh, that says Featherwing Guide, but it's Feather, OV5640 Breakout Guide that's currently in moderation. Uh, just as we were starting to meet and let me know that she had some uh, requested changes. So I'll be looking at that soon, but with any luck, that will be out for Wednesday, and I'll be talking about it on the um, show and tell, if you should tune in. Um, on Friday, I took a look at the Pico DVI text mode in Arduino, but I didn't get it working. I think uh, Phil B is still working on it, and it's not ready yet. This week is working on the Floppy Featherwing Guide, and these are some, uh, let's see, this was a question that I asked in our internal meeting, and I just copied these notes over. Uh, it's going to cover the very basics of using uh, Grease Weasel and Flex Engine, which are for archiving floppies onto your modern PCs. It'll cover some Arduino code, including a mass storage device sketch, and it will cover the CircuitPython code for uh, mounting an MS-DOS MFM floppy drive and for uh, decoding raw flux into RAM. And after that, if I get done with all that, um, I will have my hands on some upcoming products. These are like products that were teased two years ago and were not feasible to manufacture due to availability. Um, but once I have these prototypes in hand, I'll do some testing and coding on them, um, either when I'm done with the Flappy Guide or when I need a break. And that will certainly keep me busy until the next time we have uh, one of these meetings. All right, thank you, Jeff. Okay, uh, next is Jose David, who's not here, so I'll read theirs. Uh, last week, made small dock improvement for the PCA9685, testing some displays, a PR to add the temperature reading feature for the MLX 90393 magnetometer, work in an example for the community library CSV that helps you deal with CSV files easily, and some small amount of testing. This week, uh, community libraries discover and work on the verbose option for display text library. Okay, and next up is uh, maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, so last week I finished up the majority of the CircuitPython installer, which includes hunting down and fixing a bug with a flash chain with lockup. Uh, this week I'm going to finish up the PR for that and then uh, make any last minute bug fixes to the installer. I'll probably focus a bit on getting some of the slightly bigger GitHub issues fixed and possibly work on a small JavaScript library or function that is able to combine binary files similar to ESP tools merge bin function. And that's it. OK, thank you. And next is Scott. Hello. Um, first on my list is I need to reply to Dan on the Bangle.js PR. Thanks to, for getting back to me, and I, I want to get back to you soon, uh, aka today if I can. Um, I'm mostly working on PWM out on the IMXRT. So this is a similar vein to what Jeff's talking about as an upcoming 
upcoming products that we made a few years ago that we can now actually uh, get out are the IMX RT chips, which are 500 plus megahertz Cortex M7s. Um, so working with a prototype Metro with that and starting to go through kind of the core CircuitPython APIs and, and making their making kind of making sure they're up to snuff. Um, while I'm doing that, I'm working on an implementer's guide to CircuitPython API. So this is kind of a module by module info with um, tips and tricks um, and test scripts. It's not meant to go over. It's not meant to go over every single API, but it's meant to be like, here's what you need to know about implementations for this thing. Um, and then the other thing I want to do, since we're about to have the IMXRT in the shop, is I'm going to briefly look into the performance counters on the M7. Um, basically, we're using the 1011 chip has 128K of memory, and we're, we're setting aside 64K of that for what's called tightly coupled memory. Um, and so the heap on these chips is not actually that big. Um, and I just want to kind of have a story about why that is um, and, and demonstrate that it, it it's good to prioritize using that for TCM, tightly coup coupled memory, in order to get the performance out of the chip that we want. Um, so that's on my to-do list for this week. All right, thank you. And finally, uh, Tectric, who's not here, I'll read theirs. Last week, figured out how to get a file system working in RP2040.js and pushed example code for that upstream. Removed the stats page from circuitpython.org since it was defunct. Updated some of my own libraries to keep the infrastructure up to date. This week, creating a GitHub action for RP2040.js to look how library changes affect RAM usage. So that's a really interesting uh, application for this. We know exactly, since it's an emulation, we know how much RAM something, we can easily tell how much some RAM something uses without using an actual board to figure it out. And currently six, so we'll see how much gets done. Sorry to hear that. Okay, so that's the end of status updates. Uh, the next section is in the weeds, where we would have long form discussions uh, if there was some topic that we felt like we needed a more extensive discussion about instead of just a report. But we have nothing for in the weeds this week Unless anybody has anything in the last minute, but I don't see anything. And finally, um, and I'll wrap up. This has been the Circuit Python Weekly for February 21st, 2023. Thank you all for participating. If you want to support Adafruit and Circuit Python, and those that work of us that work on Circuit Python, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be mentioned in the next uh, Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Uh, the next meeting is not on a holiday. It'll be next Monday, as usual, at 2 p.m. Eastern, and 11 a.m. Pacific U.S. time. And as usual, you can go to adafru.it slash discord to uh, hang out in the meeting when we're having it. I remind you again, if you want to be added about uh, notifying about the meeting, you can be asked to be added to the at sign circuit Pythonistas role on Discord. So we hope to see you all next week. Thank you, everyone. And I will stop recording now.